Welcome to this edition of the U.S. Army Europe Podcast. I'm Jesse Granger, and we're very excited to welcome today's guest, the Sergeant Major of the Army, Kenneth Preston. Thanks for being here today, Sergeant Major. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for much. I know we don't have a lot of time with you, so I want to get right into it. Uh, first of all, you've spent a lot of time here in Europe uh, visiting and serving as well. Um, what would you say some of the advantages are to uh, serving over here in Europe? You know, for soldiers and families to get the opportunity to serve in countries outside the United States. It's a, it's a very unique opportunity that, that most Americans never get the opportunity to experience. And, you know, to come over here and live out in a German community, to travel and, and live uh, in a country that's, that's not your own, I think it makes our soldiers and their families more culturally diverse. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn another language. Uh, you learn cultural sensitivity. And it's a, it's a very unique opportunity that, that soldiers and families have. And as I look back over, over my career, I've had you know, four tours in Europe, uh, three here in Germany, one to England, and, and, and every one of those tours of duty have been very, very special. And you know, there's very special friends and relationships that you build uh, during each one of those tours of duty. And it's one of those opportunities that, that lasts a lifetime, but at the same time, it's those experiences that, that make us who we are. And now you've had the opportunity to see uh, the training here in, in the European theater and then actually putting the training to the test in theaters like Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, how is that working? When you look at uh, the, the capability of the Army and you know, specifically the forces that are here in Europe and the training opportunities that they have, there are many engagements out there that, that our formations have to interact and train with other armies. Uh, the, the training facilities, uh, the training areas over here are world class. Uh, and, and speaking firsthand from experience, you know, having you know, trained an army that, uh, that deployed from here down to Kuwait and then led the invasion going into Iraq to, to the, defeat the Iraqi army. The soldiers and the units and the organizations that, that came out of, unit, out of Europe were first class. And, uh, you know, they were phenomenal in combat and, and likewise when you look at the follow-on missions that they had at uh, security cooperation, counterinsurgency, you know, they really did a, um, uh, a world-class job at uh, completing those missions. Your military career began 35 years ago. Uh, that, that seems like a long time. Has it felt like that? No, it's, uh, I mean, retirement's inevitable for, for all of us. And, uh, you know, at some point in everyone's career, you know, the Army career comes to an end and we transition to do something else. But uh, it's gone by just, uh, you know, like the snap of a finger. It's gone by very quick. Uh, yeah, I've had a wonderful career. It's, you know, I've loved doing what I've done in the Army. And, you know, as I told, uh, you know, a group of soldiers yesterday down at the 21st TSC uh, and all the leadership, the uh, soldiers stay in the Army for three primary reasons. And, and, and I think back to that first time when I re-enlisted, it was the command climate, the leadership that I worked under. And I can tell you that my battalion commander was Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton, my company commander was Captain Ivanko, my first sergeant was First Sergeant Thee, my first platoon sergeant, section sergeant was Dale Stark. So, so when you have leaders like that, you can remember after all this time. Um, you know, it was a very positive command climate where you really wanted to be part of the team. You wanted to be part of something bigger than yourself. And, and they really built uh, an organization that was a band of brothers and sisters. Second reason was job satisfaction. You know, I came in the Army as, a, as an armor crewman. I was a, I was a scout on motorcycles. Uh, I was on tanks. I was the gunner on a battalion commander's tank. You know, so for me, job satisfaction was fun. I enjoyed doing what I was doing every day. The Army was paying me to ride dirt bikes. I was on tanks. So it was uh, very rewarding for me. And then third, quality life. And, you know, being uh, married, coming in the Army uh, with a very young family, the quality of life that I was able to provide for my family was as good or better than what I could have done getting out. And, you know, my original plan was to get out after four years and uh, go back, go to school and be an architect. But, uh, you know, going back and living on the farm, living in a house trailer, going to school full time, working the farm part time, uh, there's no way I could have provided the quality of life that we had in the Army uh, with what I would have had going back home. And no regrets? No regrets. I've, uh, you know, my personal education goals, you know, I've completed. Uh, so I've still had that opportunity to go to school and, 
you know, finished not only a uh, undergraduate but graduate degree. So those uh, goals, that was a personal goal that I set for myself. Uh, raised three children in the Army, and uh, I've been you know, very rewarded with uh, a lifetime of experiences. So speaking of your experience, um, what would you say you've seen change in the, in the Army or in the military uh, over your career, and, and what stayed the same? Well, let me start with the second part of the question. I, I'd say the thing that, that stays the same is, is soldiers. It's uh, being a soldier, being a non-commissioned officer, uh, that doesn't change. It's, uh, it's timeless. You know, when you look at our seven army values, our, our warrior ethos, you know, they've been our values and our ethos now for 235 years. So just like the army song, you know, the army keeps rolling along. And even long after I'm gone, there'll be great leaders coming in to take my place you know, to keep uh, the Army moving forward to the future. But as far as change, I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of change. But, uh, you know, change is important. Change is good. There's nothing bad uh, with change. That, you know, if you don't change, then you end up becoming obsolete. And then, particularly from an Army perspective, and, you know, when you look at the, uh, the security, the defense of our nation, and protecting the American people, had we not changed, there's many other threats out there in the world today that would have far surpassed where we were in 1975 when I came in, you know, straight out of high school. On your way out, um, how, do you, how do you think the future looks for the, uh, the Army and the non-commissioned officer corps? I think uh, when you look at the Army as a service, and I look at, um, you know, our non-commissioned officers, and in fact, you know, my theme coming up for uh, the annual nominative Star Majors Conference is uh, the profession of arms and the professional non-commissioned officer. And, and now as we begin to see uh, an increase in dwell time at home, and, and most of our units out there now are getting about 18 months, and that dwell time at home is going to continue to increase over the course of uh, the next year, and year and a half. But uh, as dwell time increases, what we want to do now is start to refocus, you know, back on you know, some, some critical skills. You know, one, we want to get back to full spectrum uh, training, full spectrum operations, you know, to rekindle uh, some of those uh, tactical skills that may have atrophied over time. Second piece is, uh, you know, to get back to some of the garrison functions and operations that we've fallen away from, you know, ensuring that, you know, soldiers are being counseled on a monthly basis. Non-commissioned officers are getting quarterly counseling. You know, those kind of programs are very important out there to, you know, bring back and, and refocus as we have more time now uh, back in garrison. Okay, so as a Sergeant Major of the Army, uh, it's fair to say that you get out a lot. I do. I travel. Um, in fact, the office tries to keep track of the miles, and, you know, to me, traveling, you know, 300,000 miles a year doesn't mean a lot. That just, you know, means you travel a lot, but, but I think that you know, it's, uh, it's who you touch and who you influence during the course of those travels. It's, you know, getting out there and speaking to soldiers. It's educating. It's teaching leaders. It's understanding what the concerns are out there in the force and then really bringing those concerns back to, you know, someone back in the building that can affect change or be able to, to really take a close look at um, making change and then, you know, where, you know, we can't make change, at least then we know and understand, you know, what the goalposts are, what the boundaries are for the quality of life or, you know, that factor out there that we're trying to affect uh, a soldier family life. Okay, so in your travels, you've met a lot of soldiers. Um, after all these years, uh, what would you say is a soldier's story that still sticks with you? What's, what's one of the moments that you'll never forget? Well, you know, to pick, uh, to pick something different, you know, outside of Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And, you know, I get, um, I get down to the Horn of Africa, you know, once or twice a year. And, you know, two years ago I was down in uh, Djibouti. And, and during that tour I had a meet, chance to meet a uh, Staff Sergeant Colson. You know, I flew into uh, uh, Camp Lemonier there in Djibouti. Uh, at that time, uh, Master Chief Petty Officer uh, Roy Maddox, uh, was uh, was uh, the master chief down there at that time, and you know he sponsored my visit. But we flew up to uh, to Ethiopia to the city of Diradawa. 
And Diradawa is the, uh, the second largest city in Ethiopia. But there was a Staff Sergeant Colson that met me there on the ground. He was the uh, NCIC of a civil affairs team. And it was a, a four-man civil affairs team. It was led by a captain, which at that time the captain uh, was, was out of theater. So he really was the NCIC, OIC of this, this team. He had a, uh, 13, uh, 13 soldiers there from uh, the Guam National Guard uh, doing security. And he also had, uh, he had a number of other soldiers in there doing work as well. You know, we jumped in his SUV and we drove out through the city. And this is a, a city of 300,000 people, uh, very poor. You know, so you can imagine driving through the city, you know, three and four story buildings, narrow alleyways, thousands of people out on the streets, you know, little three wheel uh, taxi cabs. Uh, and we drove through the city streets and we got up to a point where uh, Sergeant Colson had a uh, team of uh, Navy Seabees. And these are construction engineers that were out there uh, putting in the, uh, the 21st and 22nd water point for the people of the city to draw potable water. And of course, you had a chance to talk to the uh, the sailors there, those CBs, and you know, passed out some coins. But it was amazing to see what they were doing for the people of the city there to be able to get potable water. But from there, then we drove out to one of the suburbs of the city, and uh, he showed me a uh, school uh, construction project. And this was a primary, secondary school, two-story building. It was a two hundred thousand dollar project. The building was, for the most part, complete. They were finishing up putting the spackling on the walls, and you know, all they needed was blackboards and you know, desks and chairs. But, uh, but here's a staff sergeant that's overseeing the construction you know, of a school that uh, you know, was going to take care of literally hundreds of students you know, here in the city. And then, of course, we went from there and went back to you know, their safe house, which their safe house at that time was in the middle of the city. It was a four-story building. Uh, he had two airmen. Their uh, command and control cell was on the fourth floor. He had two airmen up there, a, a tech sergeant and an airman doing the comms link back to Camp Lemonier, which was 500 miles away, you know, in Djibouti. You know, so here's a staff sergeant, you know, his team of sailors, airmen, and soldiers out here in the hinterlands doing an amazing job. Wow. And, you know, right now today we've got uh, 231,000 soldiers currently deployed to 80 countries around the world. And, and when you take you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, you kind of move them off to the side. You know, those other 77 countries out there that we've got soldiers in, you know, many of them are the Staff Sergeant Colsons out there right now that are partnering with these other countries, uh, helping these other countries uh, build a security force, and whether it's training a police force, uh, building capacity within their army so these countries can protect their own borders, can protect their own people so that we don't have to deploy soldiers in large numbers down there to do that for them. And, uh, you know, imagine, you know, being Staff Sergeant Colson and, you know, writing your resume and, and what you can put on there about, you know, bringing water to, you know, 300,000 people in a city, building a school for hundreds of kids and, you know, really running a, an operation where you've got, you know, 15 or 20 people working for you at any one time. So it's uh, pretty amazing out there what young leaders are getting the opportunity to do. All right, Sergeant Major, uh, I know you've probably got to get back on the road, but we really appreciate you taking time to talk with us today. No, you're welcome. So, um, thanks very much. And I really appreciate, uh, you know, the opportunity to come in and spend time here in Europe and uh, spend time here with, uh, with the soldiers and families in USER once more. And that's about all we have time for on this edition of the podcast. For more on the Sergeant Major of the Army, you can always like him on Facebook. Just search SMA Kenneth O. Preston. And if you've got questions or comments for us at the podcast, you can always engage us online on Facebook as well and on Twitter, and that's at twitter.com slash U.S. Army Europe. So until next time, for the U.S. Army Europe podcast, I'm Jesse Granger. Thanks for downloading.